All right, thank you. Um, so this is going to be uh, David uh, Ledbetter, um, a look at con Linux containers, what they do and what they don't. Um, so if you can all give him a big round of applause and get him going. Um, they're not about that. They're literally the kernel itself virtualizing things. So you're not getting a full x86 system. You're getting a full Unix system that aims to make it look like you've got your own system to yourself. But actually, you're sharing the kernel with other processes and things. So um, you, you, you can't actually run a different kernel, for example. You basically are under the same kernel, but there are many bits of the kernel, including the network stack and other things, that now support virtualization. So it is basically possible to make it look like it's a different kernel as far as the user is concerned, but as far as the kernel itself is concerned, there are many different um, processes which are running under different isolation groups, um, which I'll get into. So kind of the first thing is namespaces. And um, there's, there's various namespaces in Linux now. Um, originally, there was one called the mount namespace, which was added quite a long time ago so that you could have different um, file systems mounted. But um, there are several other ones. So um, the, the way you actually get to use a namespace is you make a system call, either clone or unshare. Clone is actually the underlying system call that's used to implement fork and various other threading related things. So when you, when you clone a process, you get two copies of the process. And depending what flags you specify, you either get exactly the same process, which is effect effectively fork, or you specify different flags and it won't share the file system, open um, file descriptors, or other things. So um, for namespaces, there are various things that are called clone underscore something ns, and you ask for a new namespace of a particular kind. Um, unshare is a bit different in that that's saying, make a change to my current running process and put it into a different namespace. Um, kind of it, it depends a bit on what you're doing and why you use um, one or the other. But generally, if you actually want a separate, totally isolated container, you probably use clone. But for things like sandboxing, you might actually create a process and then use unshare to basically limit its set of privileges. Um, yeah, it depends what you're doing. So um, the main purpose of namespace is sort of to provide isolation for various resources. So this kind of, um, if you add all the namespaces together, this means you can actually begin to get virtualization. So um, network namespace is a fairly simple one. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, use an example program here, which um, co is called contain. And um, th this basically is a command line interface on top of um, the clone and various other features of virtualization. But if you give it the right flags, you can actually limit um, what um, namespaces are created. So for example, if I say, um, new net, I get a new network namespace. And then if I just run a command, say, ifconfig, um, I don't get anything back. And that's actually what's expected, because I've created an entirely new network namespace. So it's a blank namespace. There's nothing in it. Um, if instead I just run a shell inside this, um, so now if I run ifconfig minus a, you'll see here that there's actually a local loopback interface that's sitting there, but it's not configured. I can actually, if I want, give it an IP address, uh, whatever, and say up. Um, it actually doesn't matter what I give it. So I in this case, um, I can now ping that. And I'm now pinging my um, virtualized network interface. You're, I, I can't actually ping for a random example that I, I can't get to that because this is a totally empty namespace. The root table is empty. So yeah, it's 
it's quite a powerful thing, but it does mean that you actually need to do quite a lot of setup to make a network that works. And we'll get to that a bit later. Um, so then there's various other ones. Uh, there's IPC, so system V, IPC, you can um, message queues and semaphores and things, you can virtualize those so that people can't um, access the um, queues or whatever outside their container. Um, there's the mount namespace, which, like I said earlier, was the first one that was added to Linux, and it's actually quite a useful one to use because if I just go out of here, um, right, that's me. So if I now just add another flag here, so I've got new mount, um, I can basically then go into this, and I can then do weird things like begin to unmount file systems, and that will not be reflected outside um, this container. So um, if, I, if I want to virtualize the proc file system, for example, I can do that, and I'll get to that in a second. So um, UTS is also an interesting one. So this is, um, it's called uname, which might give you another hint as to what it is. It's basically the host name of the system and related things. So I can actually, within the container, change its host name, and that won't be reflected outside the container. So if I just actually run this now, and so I'm, I'm now root inside this container. It's not actually very isolated from the host here, because I haven't run with all the namespaces yet. So there are things I could do, like if I typed reboot now, I would reboot the host machine. Um, but in theory, if I run hostname, you'll see that this is actually my machine, it's got a hostname here. If I just change that, I now have a new hostname. And in theory, if I exit this, I haven't actually changed the hostname outside the container. So simple things like that, which you don't really think about, but there's lots of little details in Linux that um, contain state of the whole system. So um, th these namespaces help with that. So one of the most interesting ones is actually the process ID namespace. So at the moment, if I'm actually inside this, if I go back inside this container, uh, if I run this, I'll see all sorts of crap that I'm running um, as me. So if I then go back out of this and add a PID namespace, then if I just look at what my process ID is, I'm now one. So my shell is essentially in it, and there's nothing else running in here. So the one slightly confusing thing is if I now run PS, I still see a load of stuff. That's because actually what PS is doing is looking at the slash proc file system. And I haven't actually touched that. I've created a new mount namespace. I've created a new process ID namespace. But I haven't actually virtualized the proc file system. So what I can actually do very simply is um, just mount proc. And because that's done from within the container, the kernel now knows, whoops, um, the kernel now knows that um, that is me, and it then gives me a different view on slash proc. And if I then run ps again, I see that there are two commands. Um, so that is one of the things about sort of this low level of containers. You can very easily get into a state where you make a mistake and you somehow don't virtualize something that means that, you know, something that you, you expect that should be isolated from the outside world isn't. So, um, yeah, you have to be a bit careful with that. Um, sorry. So also, now we are in a process ID namespace. We should, and this is always a bit of a scary thing to test, but why not? It's a live demo. It's not going to go wrong. Um, I'm in a process ID namespace. It now says, this one's going down for reboot now. Um, except nothing actually happens. Um, so what it actually did is, because there's a process ID namespace, it um, has sent process ID 1, which happens to be my shell in this case, it sent it a hub signal. That's, that's all it does if you're in a process ID namespace. In theory, what you should actually do is have some program behaving as in it that handles hub and exits the whole container for you or whatever it needs to do. Um, so yeah, 
And then kind of the most interesting namespace, which is actually quite a recent thing in Linux, is, I don't know why it's doing that, doesn't matter. Um, so there's another namespace called the user namespace. And this is where things actually get quite interesting because if you've noticed before, I've been running all these as sudo. So I'm actually running as root on the host in order to get some limited set of permissions as the user. Um, but if I get rid of that, so I, right, so I'm not, I'm not allowed to run clone when I'm not root, that makes sense. However, if I now add another option, which is new user, which is gonna add to the clone system call a request to clone the user namespace as well, I'll then find that it just works. And now this is a bit weird because I wasn't root outside the container, but I am now root inside the container. So um, what, what's actually happening here is that the kernel has been told to map um, the user from outside the container to a different user ID inside the container. So this is a bit complicated because it means the kernel ha actually has to be keeping track of two user IDs and there was quite a lot of work to make this work. So for example, you'll find most Linux distributions this won't actually work on right now because XFS um, took a long time to get patched to deal with um, having this two user ID concept. And they've, I think, now got that patch into the mainline Linux kernel, but it's not yet appearing in <laughs> distributions. So um, it will be a while before that is available. But this is a really p powerful thing because it means that if I want to sandbox a process, I can essentially have a container that is a full Linux system. I can, it's a little bit difficult to do some things because you're not root. So you can't really root an IP address to a container that you've created as your user because you don't have permission unless root is running some special thing that lets you do this. So there, there are some gotchas, but basically you can treat this as an isolated container. So um, it means for sandboxing, if you've, if you've seen what Chrome does, it has a set UID helper at the moment that means that sandboxes are done via that so that it can have root privileges. Um, potentially, if you once this becomes more commonplace, actually you won't, you won't need a set UID helper and the kernel will do all this for you, which is kind of nice. Um, so the, the, there's this interesting comment, which maybe you can't read, so I'll read it out. It may, however, mean that unprivileged users may now have access to exploits in the kernel that were formerly accessible only to root, as this mail on a vulnerability in tempfs mounts notes. So it does mean that actually the kernel is now a bit more exposed and the attack surface is a bit, a bit larger because things like file systems, which you couldn't previously directly mount as non-root, you can now actually use. Um, it, actually, you can't mount most file systems because um, they just don't support this and you need a real block device and um, various other setups. So it's not too bad, but there are sort of things that weren't accessible before which now with this could be accessible. So um, yeah, whether, whether that turns out to be exploitable, I don't know, we'll see. Um, so this is also kind of interesting. The, the namespaces are just created by the clone flag, um, but they don't really have a name. So you, you can't sort of go in and debug them. So the, there's an extra entry in proc under the directory ns for each namespace. So you can actually go and look at the process and work out what um, namespace it's in. So here I'm inside the, so if I just go to prop self ns, so this is just the ns entry under this particular um, sandbox. So if I, that's not that readable. Uh, Whoops. Ah. So, maybe that makes it better. So you've, you've got here a name of each of the relevant namespaces, and then they're, they're symlinks to 
uh, inode num to, well, to a special name which includes an inode number. So y you can then actually use this with another tool called NSEnter. So if I just um, remember where I am. Um, so if I then go and find that shell, uh, which is that process ID. So if I then go NS enter, oops, ah, don't want to do that. So this is just the help for it. So um, there's, there's an option, whoops, too far back. Um, there's an option for various things. So um, set the working directory and things. So if I then ask it to basically take the process ID that it that I've got. Sorry, I'm in screen and I can't scroll properly. Uh, give me a second. No. Okay, never mind. Uh, so if I ask for this particular process ID and then so I've actually just confused my shell here because um, it doesn't know what I'm doing. But I've now run this nsenter command, and with the process ID of the other process inside this sandbox, I've now actually essentially become that user from another process. So for example, if you were debugging a container, this is a way you can actually get a sort of entry point into it without needing sort of special support from a uh, higher level thing. Um, yeah, and if I just run ID here, I've suddenly become root because I've just changed into the user namespace of this container. Um, so, yeah, the, this is kind of an interesting thing in that the uh, Linux container is not really isolated from the host in the same way that a VMware guest would be. I mean, obviously you trust the person running the the, the uh, host machine for a VMware thing, because there are many ways that you can manage the thing, but you can't really go in at the level of a single process and say, oh, what's that process doing? And you know, you can technically run a debugger from outside the container on something inside the container. So you're the, you, you obviously still have to trust the administrator, but it's very easy for them to go and poke around. So that has a benefit, but also, you know, it's, if someone were to be malicious, it would be very easy for them to just inject something into a single process inside the container or something, and you know, you, yeah, you, you can't really do much about that. But then again, it is useful. Um, so, just to step back ever so slightly, uh, the, the user namespace support um, actually has been disabled in various distribution kernels as well, and Debian has a custom syscontrol that turns it off because they're a bit paranoid about the potential security impacts of that. So, you know, I, 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 think, I think it will get to a stage where it's cleaned up enough in the kernel that people are more willing to rely on it, but maybe not yet. Um, the, the other interesting thing actually about this user namespace thing is if I poke, carry on poking around in slash proc, there's also, sorry, no tab completion. There's also this interesting thing called UID map. So this, this actually tells it to map UID 1000 outside to UID 0 inside the container. So it's kind of a way um, of mapping process ID, sorry, uh, user IDs. Um, and you actually can use sequential ranges of user IDs and stuff. And there's the support in recent versions of the shadow um, password tools to deal with having sub user accounts and other things that you need to make this work. So there is actually quite a lot of support across the whole of sort of the Linux uh, utility user land type tools for um, containers. And it, it, it's quite nice in a way in that it's sort of spread out and it's a gen generic thing, which means you can just use one bit of this if that's useful to you. But it does mean that there's not actually really a central point of documentation for all this, and it's a bit very sort of disjointed in a way. Um, so going back to the slides. So 
um, that's kind of about namespaces. Um, another thing that's used is C groups. So C groups, um, as opposed to namespaces, are a bit more um, rigid in that they're a special file system that you have to mount, and um, this can then have various. Um, sorry. This, so yeah, so you mount it under sysfs C group by convention, and um, so you have various controllers. So there's a memory one, there's a devices one, there's a block I/O one, and there's a freezer one. Freezer, I'm not going to talk about much, but it's quite interesting in that that actually allows you to freeze a whole Unix process. So a bit like putting it in the suspending it, but um, you actually then can get a special external tool that will serialize. Um, the state of that to disk, and you can then go and save a uh, process, uh, including things like its active TCP connections and restore the, them on another machine. So um, the support for this isn't yet very good, but it's something that potentially could be used to actually make a sort of um, container-based virtualization platform where you can actually switch um, processes between machines transparently and things like that. So that, that's kind of interesting. But... Um, if I just exit this, um, so this is just the C group file system here, and as you can see, there's the the ones I mentioned. There's a few others as well, which um, support various things like um, huge tables and other things like that. Um, so one of the kind of interesting things is there's a memory limit in bytes. So this isn't set up at all, that's just a very large number, I don't know, maximum 64-bit int or something like that. Um, there's not that much memory on my system, unfortunately. Um, but if you actually then go and create a C group, so th the way C groups work are, is a bit weird in that um, I, I just basically make something in here. So if I make something called foo and then I change it into foo, um, nah, that didn't work. So Eventually, it will populate um, things with files. Um, I ha apparently haven't set this system up quite right yet. Um, so, where have I gone? Right. So, if I use um, contain again, because this does it for me. So, I can go memory limit in bytes. And if I give that 10 megabytes, say. Um, now, C groups need a name, so I have to give this a name, so I'll just call it test. And if I then just run something very simple like bash, um, oops, ah, um, C groups I do actually need root for. Um, so, yeah. So I'm now inside a container which should be limited to 10 megabytes only. So if I do something like, uh, so that's just allocating 10 megabytes. I'll just print OK at the end, and then it says killed. So the kind of interesting thing about this is actually um, th this is actually using the kernel umkiller because as far as the kernel's concerned, it's a thing that's out, out of memory, and it uses the umkiller to kill it. So you get a kill minus 9 just like you would if you actually ran the system entirely out of memory. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of nice in that it's just integrated into the kernel and just works. And um, if you're familiar with ULimit, um, that's not a great thing for limiting virtual memory because you, you have to limit the amount of virtual memory and people might need to map large files, which actually don't use much kernel memory. But, but this accounts for some, some amount of kernel memory as well. So, in theory, um, if you do do something evil that results in filling up the kernel as well, then actually it will kill you anyway. So it, it, it should be a nicely isolated container. But of course, there are things which may not be perfect, but generally it works quite well. Uh, oh, can't work there. So, um, yeah, so memory limit in bytes is um, what I just talked about. Um, you can also use C groups to control what devices are allowed. So um, th this says deny all and then allow one particular device. And that's, that happens to be one colon three happens to refer to dev null. 
So the interface for this is a bit weird, and you ideally don't want to be setting this up yourself too often, but you can, if you want, go down to this level and say, you know, you're not allowed to use dev null or whatever else you want to do. Sorry, you're not allowed to use anything other than dev null. Um, so, so far we haven't really actually talked about um, anything sort of file system level, and arguably that's actually one of the most important sort of bits of virtualization, which is, you know, giving people a different view on the file system. So, actually, there isn't really any special support for this in namespaces or C groups or anything, but they're, they're part of the Linux system, so um, ch root and potentially pivot root, if you need to use that, um, can be used. So basically, you just create a new mount namespace and then ch root into it. And the nice thing actually is because, um, if we go back slightly, so here I'm running this as a user, so. No, no need for any extra permissions. And then um, I am root though, so I have a convenient Debian ch root just here, and I can then ch root into that, and I'm still root, and I'm now inside a ch root. Um, so that, that's kind of nice in that it, it's fairly simple to use that, and I can use that then as a user. So this means if you're familiar with things like fake root for Debian building, actually you can replace this with something that uses the kernel. And fake root works by LD preloading a uh, library that basically lies to anything that calls it that it now owns these files and that it remembers file ownership and it's a bit of a weird hack because there are things where that can go wrong. So this is actually quite nice in that it's using the kernel support, but it can be done isolated as a user, so you don't need root in order to build a package that needs root to build, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of nice. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very Unix-y, really, because there are all these parts that you're putting together. And if you put them together right, then you end up with a very nice uh, system whereby you can play around with the exact aspects that are virtualized or virtualized more or less or whatever you want to do. Um, so really, you probably don't want to be using this directly yourself. It's kind of interesting to play with, but um, system D actually behind the scenes is already using C groups. So if you are using a fairly recent Linux system, you, you probably are already using C groups without realizing it. Um, there's a utility thing that comes with system D called system D nspawn, which allows you to basically run a particular um, system inside a container like this. And if you actually look at the man page for that, there's some very simple examples at the end that say, this is how to run deb bootstrap to get a Debian root file system. And then you can run systemd and spawn with the right options. And you end up with a file system that is isolated. And then you can run that get install or build your package or whatever you want to do inside that. Um, Docker and LXC kind of go together. So Docker underneath is actually using LXC. Um, if you're not familiar with Docker, it's a very nice system where you actually you basically give it very simple recipes and it will um, go, go away and install whole systems for you. And um, it makes use of extra features on top of containers like um, union file systems. So you can have um, a very simple uh, file system to start with and then you can add a web server to that. And, um, you can then save that under a name and recreate it later. So it's, it's really quite nice and builds on all this and adds sort of a management layer that isn't really present in the uh, sort of lower level stuff. Um, there's something called Let Me Contain That For You, which um, is written by Google and sort of allows fairly low level control. Um, it's still rather work in progress, but um, the idea there is to sort of complement Docker and various things. And then there's something called PFLASK, which is actually quite a nice, simple thing that is similar to the contain thing that I've been using as an example, but a little bit more full-featured. And um, they have some good examples of things you can do, like you could run a web browser in a way that it can't actually see your home directory. So you can actually use bind mounts 
to hide your home directory from the web browser. So it's still running technically as your user, but you've hidden any files that you're scared that you know some weird web website might try and steal from you or whatever. So it's kind of a, a level of isolation, but limited in that it's still able to talk to your X server and things. So um, yeah, that's quite nice. Um, so that's mostly the end. Um, kind of, the, there's two good article series on um, Linux Weekly News. Um, the first one is, I think, a seven series of articles about namespaces, and it goes through uh, process ID namespaces up to user namespaces and all the other ones. Um, and then there's also a quite recent series on C groups because they've actually begun to change how C groups work because they turned out to be quite complex and didn't really work for everyone. And System D is now kind of managing them, and there's a bit of there's a bit of discussion about exactly what's going to happen there. So um, that's that's quite an interesting series to read. Um, um, that's pretty much it. So. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free. I think there's a mic over there. Yeah, just wait for the mic to make sense. I was just wondering what the uh, performance hit is when you containerize a new process. Like, how many containers can you spin up before you have problems? Um, so it's only really a Linux process, so there isn't a huge performance hit. I mean, if you do things like create a new uh, mount for everyone, of course, there are kind of you'll be using more space in the kernel for that, and um, one thing I didn't really mention is networking, and if you actually start wanting to ha sort of isolate them on the network, you then need to give each one a separate IP address and all stuff like that, which actually gets a bit more complex. But if you were just running up basically a container that had input and output and nothing else. So would it make sense to spin up a new container to service like a web request? Or is it? Um, so a so you're, you're, it, it's, that, that would be a bit like running CGI in that you'd be forking for essentially for every request. So it, it wouldn't be great for every web request, but maybe you could do something like if you had several workers for your web server, you'd keep those in a separate container. But usually kind of the idea is you run a particular server in a container, and then that's kind of an isolated thing. So you wouldn't usually go to that level. But they are actually fast enough that if you did want to do something. Um, for example, I've got a, well, it's an IRC bot that, where you can just give it random Unix commands to run, and it runs those in a container. And I'm relatively happy to trust that to not, I probably won't put it on a public channel, but it's on a channel with a few friends on, and, you know, it's quite useful for playing around, and it's fast enough to make that kind of thing work. So, yeah. Any more? Um, are the, the namespaces, are they nestable? If you uh, create, uh, let's say as a regular user, um, something that you're then root within, can that create its own virtual yes. namespaces yeah, within yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, that works. Okay. Um. <laughs> Any more? Okay, well, thank you very much.